What's good, Knicks Nation? Alex Terrace here, a.k.a. the Tratocaster, back again with another Game of the Week preview. And this time we are previewing the New York Knicks facing the Los Angeles Lakers. They'll be at Madison Square Garden playing on TNT at 7.30 p.m. Tuesday night. And with me to break this game down is none other than Alex Hollingsworth, founder of Lakers Central. You can go follow him on Twitter at Lakers Central 365. But before we get into this preview, you all know what to do. Make sure to hit that thumbs up button for your boys and make sure to check out KnicksFanTV.com, which is sponsoring this show. All right. So it is Sunday, January 29th at 3.30 p.m. Alex, how you doing, man? How are you feeling today? I feel all right. I mean, you know, that 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 Boston loss uh, doesn't feel too good for myself or the rest of Lakers Nation. But aside from that, I, I can't complain. <laughs> I feel you, man. It's a, you know, like, I thought I was going to have that same feeling as you when I, I was at that game on Thursday night where the Knicks played the, the Celtics TNT. Uh, thankfully, we came out on the on the winning side, you know, where Jalen Brown decided to choke. But I feel that you get a missed call. You know, refs, well, another one. We get it, man. I get it. As Knicks fans, we always complain about the refs. We get about, the, we understand that feeling. But, yo, we don't have to worry about that. We're moving on. We all know how Anthony Davis feels. Pat Bev taking the camera, showing the ref, like, yo, man. Crazy. You, mister. That is by far top five moment in NBA history for trolling a ref for a missed call. I, that That is like, I, I thought I was watching <laughs> WWE stuff right there, man. Thought I was watching WWE stuff right there. But we're not going to talk about that game. We're not going to live in the past. Let's talk about this game. What are your thoughts about the Lakers uh, this season overall? I mean, it, look, um, the Lakers could have started off much better. They started off 2-10. and 10. Either way, I kind of look at it. Um, Rob Palenka is the vice president of the Lakers basketball operations. He built an imbalanced team. The team basically had no forwards outside of LeBron and Anthony Davis. And Look, if you've got LeBron and Anthony Davis, I mean, that's that's a hell of a starting point, right? But he built an imbalanced team, and so mm -hmm. the Lakers already started off kind of behind the eight ball. And so it feels like they just keep trying to claw themselves um, out of this – out of out of non-playoff contention. And, you know, they're like three games back of the fifth or sixth seed in the West, which is nuts considering where they started and just all the nonsense going on uh, with the Lakers this season. But – they're a trade away, man. We need one more trade. God, we need one more trade. Talk about trades, man, and being a trade away. You know, we just saw the the Lakers trade for Rui Hachimura and Kendrick Nunn up, up out of here. How do you feel about that trade for Rui? No, Rui is great, man. I mean, look, 6'9", 230. He's 24 years old. He's a young guy. He still has, a, you know, at least 10 years in the league, if not longer. A lot of room to grow. I like it for the Lakers. They were short um, at powerful and, and small forwards. We had like seven guards. We still have too many guards, even with Kendrick Nunn being traded. We've got way too many guards, not just guards, man, but like undersized guards, guards that's like under 6'4", six, 6'3". Six, so it, I think that's a, that's a heck of a trade for the Lakers. It came out of nowhere. F us as fans, even those of us that, you know, talked to some people around the team, we didn't know that Rui was even on the Lakers radar. There was all this talk around Lakers trying to get Kuzma back to L.A. But, you know, I, I like it with Rui. Um, now let's see where they go. You know, at, shout out to CP because I've definitely talked to him and I said, hey, man, Cam Reddish for a second. Let's see if the <laughs> Lakers could, 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 could get him. I mean, let's take a flyer on him, man. You guys don't want him. Tibbs don't play him. We'll, we'll take a flyer on him. <laughs> Look, man, I know so. There's a, there's a good contingent of the Cam Hive that wants to see him play. I'd like to see him play too, and, and just get some shine on the Knicks. Show what he could, what he could, how he can help this team. I mean, he offers something that this team lacks, which is defensive versatility, his ability to attack out and transition and stuff like that. But as you noted, Tom Thibodeau doesn't want to play him. wasn't a fan of the trade. So, and you know, there's rumors of him on the trading block, either going to Milwaukee. Dallas, you know, the Knicks are trying to get Grayson Allen. But as of right now, the, the mm -hmm. thought process is that we'll probably get Serge, George Hill, second round pick, and some salary filler for what is like, yeah, okay, okay, great. Guys that are really aren't really gonna help this team whatsoever. <laughs> Whatever. Just just trading for second round picks, which seems what Leon Rose likes to do, or bring back Reggie Block, which is another like eh, not really a fan of, but mm -hmm. it is what it is. So 
what are you looking for? You know, you talk about you want Cam on the team. Totally understand that. But who are, who are you looking for the Lakers to go out there and get to add to the team to help you guys become like that playoff caliber team? Yeah, I, I think there's a number of trades the Lakers could look at. Um, I mean, look, there's always the names that have been linked to the Lakers since the summertime, like Buddy Heald, for example. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think Buddy Heald used to be represented by Rob Palenka. You know, Rob was his former agent, so there's a connection there. Mm-hmm. Buddy Heald leads the NBA in three-pointers made. As everyone knows, the Lakers are not very good at three-pointers. So, mm-hmm. to me, that Buddy is 30 years old. He probably age wise doesn't really match the the timeline for the Pacers, so why not? If you're the Lakers, see if you can make something happen. Um, so I think he would help. Um, Boyan Bogdanovich, the Lakers were linked to him when he was still in Utah. He ended up getting traded to the Pistons. Now there's word the Pistons might want a first round draft pick and whatever. You know, Lakers need shooters, man. So I just somebody that can knock down a shot. I don't care if they can defend or not. <laughs> give me a knockdown shooter. Just just give me a knockdown shoot on the Lakers. I think that would be helpful. And then again, like guys like Cam Reddish, man, like give me a young guy that's has some potential that's six eight, six nine, even six seven, that that can that can kind of grow with the Lakers. Look, any I think any 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 of those guys that I named, a young guy that that maybe can grow, I think would help the Lakers make a playoff push. How would you feel about one Evan Fournier from the New York Knicks? You know, I'm 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 contrary to a lot of Lakers fans. I'm not I'm not really against it. I mean, he hasn't mm. really played either, so I don't I don't know what he's got left in the tank, but he's not a bad shooter. I know his contract isn't great. And so Lakers fans have this thing where, you know, we had we got Russell Westbrook, his contract isn't so great. They they're afraid to trade for anyone else that might not have a satisfactory contract. So, um you know, I, I don't know. Evan just hasn't played in a while, but he's a he's a shooter. I mean, I'm curious, man. What's what's going on in New York? Why hasn't he played? I mean, why hasn't he played? I mean, you say you you don't care about defense. You might as well just take this man because he <laughs> won't play defense. I mean, he tries some days, but it is what it is. He's not playing because, and, and I and I said this before the beginning of the season because we saw a glimpse of it last year. Quentin Grimes is our best perimeter defender. When you as soon as they got Jalen Brunson. You know, a, a small point guard. You know, Brunson has been phenomenal for us offensively, being a facilitator and so forth. But defensively, he's limited, okay, because he's he's such a small point guard. So you need someone who's going to be able to to mask his deficiencies, and that's Quentin Grimes, Evan Fournier, mm-hmm. shooter. Yeah, he could be he can he he could be a solid shooter when he gets going. The thing is that we don't need another score. We're not going to be this dominant offensive team. You know, we're a good scoring team right now, NBA-wise, how many points we put up, but we're not going to be, uh, you know, any prolific scoring team over here, right? Like, you, we, we, yeah. we just lost to the Nets last night. They don't have a Kevin Durant, but we're not, we're not close to that, that type of style where we're just knocking down threes constantly. We're attacking from all over the place, from all of our guys. It's a different style of uh, basketball that the Knicks play. So for him, because he can't play defense and just being a liability, not being able to get back in transition – you know, he 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 sags too much into the paint and not really defending the three-point line, even though that's also Tom Thibodeau's scheme. Doesn't really fit what this team needs right now, so that's why he's been put to the wayside. The contract, not not terrible. I mean, he signed. It's a four-year agreement with the last year being a team team option. He's in the second year of it, so he's got one more for seventeen around seventeen million. So I think that's a I think that's doable for any team that's looking to add some shooting. I think he would be a good six man coming off the bench. You know, his time in Orlando, he was a playmaker, score. They allowed mm-hmm. him to rock in the starting rotation, but I think he could be a solid six-man for the right team, and especially if a team like the Lakers that needs scoring and some shooting, the guy that you have to honor from three-point range. I, I could see Fournier fitting on, on that team right now, but, you know, outside of needing guys like that for the Lakers, you know, let's talk about your current roster because it's been interesting. You talked about you, – you said at the beginning, actually, that it is – I think a lot of us as NBA fans looked at that roster and be like, what? What is going yeah. on here? Like, where's the shooting? You know, you got Lonnie Walker and all these other guys. Um, but let's talk about your big three that you got. Let's start off with Russell Westbrook because I think it's been fascinating based off the rumors of this offseason, whether him and LeBron are on the same page, him adapting to the six role, six-man role. Give me your thoughts on Russell Westbrook this season. 
I mean, look, man, credit Russ. He's accepted the six man, six man role. Darwin's got him to come off the bench. Um, I think Russ is playing as well as he can, given the situation. Um, his contract aside for a second, I think one of the biggest issues with Russ in LA is that everything that Russ does, LeBron does better, right? So there's these redundancies and mm-hmm. having both of them on your team. And I think at one point the thought was, well, it's always been this since LeBron's been in LA, LeBron needs another playmaker. Hell, it was that way in Cleveland and in Miami when you had Dwayne Wade and Kyrie, right? Mm-hmm. Give LeBron a secondary playmaker. The issue with that when it comes to Russ is, one, Kyrie can just knock down shots all over the floor, right? So even if Kyrie's mm-hmm. not playing defense, you've got to guard him all over the floor offensively. And Dwayne Wade, obviously prime Dwayne Wade, was one of the best defenders in the league. He could play off the ball. I mean, he could do everything, right? Mm-hmm. Russ, on the other hand, one, he's not in his prime anymore. Um, he's never been a great shooter. Mm-hmm. He used to be pretty good from the mid range, uh, but that's pretty much gone to the wayside. So he can't even hit like a mid range jumper anymore. He actually was not bad from the corner three last year, but then this year, I think he's shooting like 28% from the corner three. So, like every, you know, look, he's doing as well as he can coming off the bench. Um, the biggest issue is now you enter, you know, I'm, I'm going to go to his contract. He's making 47.1 million, and mm. your six man can't make 47.1 million. You can't have a guy that, you know, doesn't play defense, can't hit shots, can't close out games for you. You can't have him taking up that much of the salary cap. That's an issue, especially when your two best players are LeBron and AD, one in his 20th season and one that, you know, has a lot of injury concerns, right? Your third guy can't be Russell Westbrook in this current iteration of the Lakers. Yeah, and uh, you know every time Knicks fans try to think about, especially before before the beginning of the season, uh, even myself included, I, I'll, I'll put myself out there. You know, you were thinking about how do you open up, like how do you peel back this team. My thoughts about peeling back this team has changed quite a bit, but when you hear about like peeling back this team, like especially this off season, like oh, why don't we trade Randall for for Westbrook and cut him? And it's like it still ruins your cap, man. <laughs> even when you cut him, we just had Keith Smart on last week, and, and that contract is just it's detrimental. It's detrimental, so I, I totally hear you on that. But what do you think? So with him adopting the six man role, obviously he's inflated. What's the what's the ideal situation for him? Then this is the last year of his contract, right? So do you see him just being gone yeah. from LA next year, or do you see him coming back and still being a six man? What are the thoughts about that? In my opinion, he needs to go, mm. and that look that's no fault of his own. Um, Russ is a future Hall of Famer. And that contract that he has now, he got for his past performances. So I'm all for players getting paid. Like, get your money. I have no issue with that. For sure. Um, but as it relates to to the Lakers, I don't think that he can come back next year, even at a reduced salary. I just, I don't think that it works. Um, his personality hasn't fit well with fans. Um, mm. and, and so there's, there's this clash. There's rumors that ownership may want to bring him back at a reduced number. What reduced is, I have no clue, right? I don't know what <laughs> Russell, West, Russell Westbrook is worth next year as a player. Is it six million? Is it ten million? I mean, to go from forty-seven to six or seven million is a that's a hell of a drop off, right? So I'm sure he's going to be seeking more than that. So I I don't know, um, but moving forward, I think that his fit on the Lakers is just it's bad, and I I just don't think that he's a he needs to stick around any longer. Okay. Well, let's talk about another guy that's on the team that, you know, who's very critical to the team, but seems to miss a lot of playing time, which is one Anthony Davis. How how have your thoughts been on AD? I mean, he was back last night. We talked about him playing against uh, the Celtics, but what has your thoughts been about Anthony Davis as his entire career as a Laker so far? I mean, he got there. We won a championship. So, you know, he did his job. Up, right mm-hmm. like the lakers hadn't won a championship in a decade ad and lebron show up and you know i know people like to discredit the bubble but that was one of the from my viewpoint one of the most toughest seasons ever whether it was because of COVID and the season shutting down and not knowing if it was going to restart to these guys having to leave their families and go isolate in, in disneyland disney world wherever the hell it was in florida or mm-hmm. if it was obviously the death of kobe which happened also you know it, it impacted all fans, but for Lakers fans, it hit different. It hit the team different, right? Mm-hmm. So he came in, the Lakers won immediately. And then the following season, the Lakers started off 21-6. and six. 
They were up two games to one on Phoenix in the playoffs. I mean, we were waltzing right back to the finals all over again. And then, you know, AD got hurt. And I think from that point on, um, AD's injuries are ticky tacky, man. You know, they're not, you know, they're not those things where he misses an entire season or anything like that, mm-hmm. but he misses sometimes 10, 15, 20 games, which can throw off continuity. Um, and you saw this year when he came in this year and he was healthy and he looked like the MVP of the league. I mm-hmm. mean, he was playing center fans want him to play center. He was dominating. Um, I love Anthony Davis, man. I, you know, I, I know that he gets hurt more often than, than fans would like. Um, but I love Anthony Davis. And I think that the Lakers need to surround Anthony Davis and LeBron with, with more complimentary players. When they have complimentary players, the Lakers are going to get into the playoffs when they do not have complimentary players, you put more pressure on AD and LeBron to basically close the gap. And that's not fair to them. No. Nah, and I totally understand that. Right. So with, and that makes sense. Look, when we, when Anthony Davis is on the court, he's definitely top five player in the league, the way he's able to, you know, just put the ball in the hoop, the way he can defend. It's, it's another level that not many bigs are capable of doing. So I guess my next thing for Anthony Davis then is that, because he's so important to this team and its construction, because you see when he misses time and it's just LeBron James, yeah. and especially for this season, the Lakers are, we're, 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 let me see where they're on the stand. They're not even in the playoffs right now. You know, 13th. They're, 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 they're 13th, as you mentioned in the Western conference. It's, it's a, it's a slug fest right now in the Western conference, just to make, try to make the playoffs, let alone the play in. So do you see, like, how is it, how are you moving forward with Anthony Davis? Like, because there's some, I've heard some say, you know, maybe you move Anthony Davis, try to get even maximize on what his value is and start getting ready for life after LeBron. Are you thinking that way? Or are you still saying, no, nah, we got to keep Anthony Davis and figure out how to add more draft capital to build around him for the future? Yeah, no, look, you keep Anthony Davis. Like, I mean, 60 games of Anthony Davis is still better than 82 games of you name the next big man outside of Jokic and Embiid. Mm -hmm. It's Anthony Davis, right? So you keep Anthony Davis. Um, This is one of the reasons I'm against a three-star build because the three-star build puts the Lakers in a position where one guy goes down, the rest of the roster is all minimum salaries. And so the Lakers need to build out more of a well-rounded roster around LeBron and Anthony Davis so that when one of them do miss time, You've actually got guys who make, you know, maybe you've got two or three guys that make 20 to 15 million, a couple guys making 7 million or so, the mid level, whatever. You just have a more well balanced roster, right? You know, that's what they need to do. In terms of draft capital, you know, the Lakers, you know, at, at least in terms of what we can trade, it's only the 27th and uh, 2027 and 2029 draft picks. That's what we have tradable, although we have other draft picks that just tied up with the trade with the, uh, the Pelicans, the Lakers are in a win now mode. At least they should be. When LeBron mm-hmm. James is on your team, you're winning. You're trying to win now, not a decade from now. Because even if you keep those draft picks from 2027 and 2029, even if you look, man, even if some by some chance you get the number one pick and you draft LeBron, another LeBron in 2027 to 2029, that guy won't be ready until like 2030 or 2032. Mm-hmm. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? So you have to build around AD and LeBron now, but also to me, the elephant in the room is you don't want to piss off clutch. You don't want to piss off any high end agency, right? Like Mm -hmm. you need relationships and agents steer their players to various teams. I know you guys have Leon Rose who used to be with CAA. Like you don't want to piss off these agents and these, these agencies. AD is a top five guy when he's right. You build if you build the right team, they can sustain guys missing time. They should have anticipated guys missing time, given that LeBron is in his 20th season. AD has had some injury concerns. I'm glad that you brought up clutch because I got to ask you this question. Um, and there is, you know, and then we're gonna get to LeBron James. But we all know Rich Paul, LeBron James, they've been friends, best friends for a very long time. But the criticism when it comes to bringing in LeBron James is that. It's his guys, right? He he. It's an overhaul of the team, and right now it's the Lakers with you can just call them Team Clutch. How's your? What are your thoughts about being Team Clutch right now? Because 
you know, you had guys like KCP, Kyle Kuzma, you know, Quinn Cook, a lot of guys that were on that roster that that helped you win that chip. And you let those guys go. You know, even Alex Caruso, another guy who, who was very key to that Lakers success. You let these guys go. You're bringing a lot of guys through clutch. But it's, you know, I, I understand being like having that relationship with an agency, making sure that you're able to attract players that to come to that team. But at what point do you say this is a little too much because now you have a team that's not even built for LeBron James and Anthony Davis and it's tough. So what are your thoughts about having clutch as being the, uh, you know, being, I guess, you know, to the, to the Knicks and CAA clutches to the Los Angeles Lakers. So how do you feel about that? I, look, I, I think clutch delivered LeBron and Anthony Davis and, you know, Rich Paul has built an agency from the ground up, right? He's not one of these guys who, Mm -hmm. everyone knows rich's background and his profile right mm -hmm. rich really did kind of build this thing up even though lebron is his friend rich built this thing up and mm -hmm. you know the lakers you know when you look at rob palenka and some of the other guys in the front office that, that the lakers have they don't have relationships around the nba that's one of the biggest issues fans have with with rob and and kurt rambis who used to be out there in new york and <laughs> coach the Knicks with <laughs> bill jackson was there right like you've got these guys in the front office that don't have relationships around the league or if they do have relationships they're not great and so mm -hmm. i think the lakers have to rely on their relationship with clutch to bring guys in kcp was clutch and they traded him out right now alex caruso there's an argument to be made that the lakers chose tht over alex caruso because tht was clutch mm -hmm. the truth is the lakers could have brought both of them back they could have give, given tht his extension and re-signed alex caruso but they didn't want to pay the luxury tax so mm -hmm. to me, that's just, look, I don't want to call owners cheap, but mm -hmm. I think sometimes owners pocket watch themselves a little bit. And I'm a big believer in if you drive a sports car, right? Whatever, whatever kind of nice car, you know, you want to drive. If you drive a high end car, if you can't afford the maintenance, you shouldn't be driving a high end car. And I believe the same is said about the Lakers, certainly the Knicks. If you own a team like that, and you can't afford the luxury tax, well, then maybe you need to step aside mm. because these these teams, these brands demand that you spend money because fans are spending all of this money. You and I were chatting briefly offline, and I talked about the ticket prices to see the Lakers play. I mean, it's not cheap to see them play, and so when, when fans are pumping this money into the team, ownership needs to be willing to spend to bring in whoever they need to bring in. But as it goes back to clutch, I wonder if the Lakers could even get some of the players they've gotten if it wasn't for Clutch's help. Interesting. I mean, that, that it's a balance, right? You don't want an agency running your franchise, so you have to balance that accordingly. Right. Um, but I think delivering LeBron and AD, and I just I think Clutch has done a lot of positive things to help the Lakers ultimately win the championship that they did. All right, and so let's move on to LeBron James now because. That is the that is the catch, right? That was the whole, you know, the last year in Cleveland. It was always speculated that he was going to go to L.A. He did go to L.A., you know. Um, so how's you how's your feelings been? I know, like, I guess it, I, I guess it would be the same that you know he brought the chip, so you love LeBron James right now, and I would expect I would expect that. How do you feel about him watching what he's been doing for the Lakers in at his age, man? Because this is just insane yeah it i mean look lebron um man, he's a play he's, he's a player of excellence man and the way he treats his body the way he goes about his craft and honestly man it reminds me of kobe like kobe was the same way and you know one of my biggest fears is lebron trying to drag this team into the playoffs and we saw it with kobe six years ago five six years ago same thing dragging a team into playoffs and then you get injured and I don't want to see that for LeBron. So, I, I look, I love what LeBron is doing. What he's doing this 20th season is unprecedented. It's insane. Um, the Lakers need to be careful not to ride him too, too hard. Mm -hmm. Like, when you get in the playoffs and things like that, sure, LeBron's going to do what LeBron does. But LeBron shouldn't have to throw up 30 and 40-point games every night just for the Lakers to maybe win a game right now. Mm -hmm. That's that's ridiculous. And I think that the Lakers are taking him for granted. Um and you know, hopefully the season turns out better than last season. But I think they're they're asking too much of him, even though he's delivering. They're asking too much of him in this twentieth season. 
Hey man, it, it helps me for prize picks. You know, I just say I might see when I see that the <laughs> it's either more than like twenty eight and a half points or thirty and a half points. I'm like, I am taking the over immediately because I know as with especially without Anthony Davis, he had to put up the points. But yep, the the thing about LeBron is that there's been this whole talk about maybe him being traded, him not staying with the Lakers, and all this type of stuff. So wh- when you hear all of that, what are your thoughts? LeBron has made it clear he wants to finish his his career in L.A. Mm. I truly think that he wants to. Um, if LeBron does not, that is an indictment of Los Angeles' ownership, Ooh. not anything else. That The Lakers have had the luxury of having guys like, you know, Wilt Chamberlain, Elgin Baylor, uh, Jerry West, right? Mm. Magic, Kareem, Shaq, Kobe you want LeBron to retire a Laker. Like, that's what you want. You don't want LeBron to go go back to Cleveland and retire there or go, go to some other team and retire. You want LeBron's final years to be associated with the Lakers. And so, like I said, if he does not he finish his career as a Laker, that's an indictment of ownership, that they did not do what they needed to do to surround him with the championship-level roster. Okay. You know, not – and. Obviously, the roster is only as good as the coach. So let's talk about Darvin Ham, man. What are your thoughts have been about him as the head coach this season? You know, you had Frank Vogel, who won your chip. He's out. Yep. Ham's in. Give us the four one one. I like Darvin, man. I mean, look, he's a rookie head coach, so there were going to be growing pains with him. There were going to be growing pains, and he has his issues, right? He loves these three guard lineups where he he plays like Dennis and Pat Bev and then like a third guard. Sometimes it was Kendrick Nunn, it's, you know, it's Westbrook, and it's just like, oh my God, man, these three guard lineups are killing us. Um, so he's got his issues, right? Um, but at the same time, he's able to get Russ to come off the bench and he's a player's coach. Right. So I, I'm a big believer in when you bring you bring someone in that is a player's coach, um, you know, he can do the motivational thing and get guys to kind of buy in. Then it was on the Lakers. Again, I'm going to go back to front office and ownership. It was on them to make, to ensure that he had people on his roster that might have been, you know, m- maybe they were more X's and O's guys. So while Darwin does more of the, you know, the leadership stuff, he's got X and o, X's and O's guys. Phil Jackson, I think, is the greatest coach of all time in any sport. <laughs> Phil Jackson ran the triangle, right? Mm-hmm. But Phil oh, Jackson we know that. <laughs> we, we know that over here. We know about the right? triangle. <laughs> right. You know, the triangle, right? Uh, you know, he, obviously he won championships in LA and, and, and Chicago with the triangle, but like Tex Winters, Tex Winters was the architect of the triangle. He was the guy behind Phil that. Like, you know, he could, he could motivate you when he was in LA and Chicago. You got to have another guy on your bench that can kind of do the stuff that your head coach can't do. Um, and that's, again, that's where I think the Lakers may have dropped the ball. But he's a first, mm. first year head coach, man. This, it's going to be rocky. Okay. You know, and so, and, and look, man, we get that. Well, we have a seasoned head coach and Tom Thibodeau over here where, you know, we have our gripes with Tiz, whether it comes to adjustments, using a, just what seems like to be mm-hmm. one disadvantage scheme, the drop coverage, and just allowing so many three pointers to be shot. Not very creative when it comes uh, to the offensive side of the ball. And you mentioned that the three-guard rotation is like one of the issues that you have with him. Give us a few more things, man, because I think as fan bases, you know, we can we can shy past like some of the good stuff the coach can do, and we really harp in on, on, on the bad stuff. But I feel like as a fan, we always like harp in on the bad stuff. It's like, why is it only us? Why is it only us that has like a coach that only does these bad things? So give me some of the – give me some of the top things that – you know, outside of the three-guard rotation that irritates you with uh, Ham's coaching right now? Yeah, I think, you know, besides the three-guard lineup, man, it's, you know, his, he loves Russell Westbrook and he really believes in him. And that ends up leading to Russ playing in crunch time, which isn't very helpful to the Lakers. Boston, hmm. he didn't play the entire fourth quarter, but then Russ played in overtime and it didn't go so well. So Ham has a tendency to over-believe in some of these guys. Um that I think gets gets him in trouble a little bit. Mm. And, you know, I, I think he's not great making adjustments on the fly. I also think that that's just part of that is just, you know, you're a new head coach. 
right? Mm -hmm. And you have to learn these things. The difference is, is that he's coaching for the Los Angeles Lakers with LeBron James and Anthony Davis and the spotlight is on. And so when you make a mistake, it's magnified in a way that, you know, would be very different if you were coaching, say, the Charlotte Hornets. No one would pay attention, but it's the Lakers. So, you know, lineups, not being able to to make make changes on the fly, and playing Russ in crunch time, man, those are things that really have hurt us this season. Okay, okay, and there you have it. There you have it. Now, I just got to ask you one quick thing before we really get into this preview and really start breaking down this game. Your whole thoughts on the Shannon Sharp incident, man. I mean, it just made the rounds. We had to talk about it on Knicks Fan TV uh, after we lost to the Hawks. CP and I were just joking about it. Just give you, just give us like your quick takes on, on the whole Shannon Sharp incident. I mean, it look, man, it's 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 stupid, right? I mean, it, Shannon Sharp obviously is an ex NFL player, so he's a celebrity, you know, and, and he's going back and forth with Dylan Brooks. And all of it is just stupid. I mean, it was never going to really escalate to violence. It, those mm -hmm. of us that were watching it, knew, you know, you know that, right? But yep. it was just stupid. Um, you know, Chan is a little old to be engaging in some of that nonsense. But, <laughs> hey, look, Dylan Brooks is notorious for talking trash to LeBron James. And so Lakers fans, including the celebrity fans, are going to let him know about it when, when, when they come to L.A. And that's what happened. So, you know. It, it it gave uh, all the sports talk shows something to talk about. Of course, of course. And that's all we look for, man. That's all that's all when we go to like ESPN and all these things, we're just looking for something <laughs> entertaining, something for them to talk about. When you want to hear actual coverage about the game and the details, that's why you come to us. And now let's go into the details and the coverage of the game, right? Right. So we got this matchup. We got the Lakers coming into into town, taking on the New York Knicks. Historic rivalry right there. You know, especially when you go back to the 70s. Talk about the championship times. But now, man, it's two teams on two totally different directions. Uh, Lakers obviously win now team trying to make it back into playoff contention. New York Knicks are currently in the plan, looking to get out of the plan, going into playoff, like gain like one of the top six areas so that way they don't have to go through it. And this team is competing, man. And the two guys I gotta watch out for this game is none other than Julius Randle. And LeBron James. Now, I'm not saying these guys are going to be defending each other, although I would not be surprised. But Randall, you know, he left the he left the Lakers. And I actually want a little bit of your thoughts about Randall too, because he was he used to be a Laker. That's who drafted him. You know, he left the Lakers because he knew LeBron James was coming in, went on his own venture, now goes to the next big major media market in New York, yep. and has had an up and down career. You know, first year he was a Tasmanian Devil. Loved to utilize that spin move. Became a most improved player, second All-NBA, All-Star second season. Last year, lost the fan base, wasn't as efficient player. Now he's won it again. It's quite the story for Julius Randle, man. And he's been balling this year. Absolutely deserving of the All-Star. Has been tough as nails for us, especially when it comes down to the mid-range, attacking in the post. And honestly, might have to have, not might, needs to have the conversation how he's a stretch four right now. Because even though he's shooting slightly below league average, around 35%, He's doing a good job, man. He's shooting like 34.8% from three. Decent on high volume, too. About seven to eight attempts per game. So just phenomenal stuff from Randall. And then LeBron James, we know it's the king. We know who he is. We just talked about it. He is, he's dominant, man. He's dominant. So these two guys are who I'm looking for to lead both teams. Uh, just with physicality uh, on both sides of the ball. What do you think about that? The matchup so far and are there any other matchups that you're looking at in this game yeah i mean that, i think this is probably the matchup that you know everyone will be paying attention to julius is having a good season for you guys and you know i, I you know even though i don't i don't watch a whole lot of knicks I, I do know that he fell out of favor with the fan base after having a really good season there um the lakers man you know we um magic johnson famously let julius you know release his uh his cap hold and let Julius kind of just walk and go wherever he wanted rather than trading him and getting maybe a draft pick or something in return. And Julius has had, you know, I think a fine career in New York. Mm -hmm. um, but I think this is a heck of a matchup. Both of those guys are, you know, big, strong guys. They like to get to the rim. Um, Julius's jumper has certainly improved over the years versus what it looked like when he was in LA. Um, so I'm curious to see if they actually do defend each other. I think they will. I mean, 
you're not going to probably put Julius on AD. I mean, they might, you know, might, maybe some cross matchups, maybe they match up a few times, but LeBron is probably the guy that ends up um, guarding him. I'm curious to mm-hmm. see what it looks like. I'm wondering if, because Julius is kind of a big, strong guys guy, I'm wondering if LeBron continues to go to the rim and try to bully his way to get baskets inside, or if he starts doing that, you know, pull up, step back, LeBron three that he does all the time. If he, you know, mm-hmm. kind of relies on his three. I, I don't know, but I, I do think this is a matchup to watch. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely gonna be an interesting matchup. And I feel like there's uh, you know, every time with this matchup, and yeah, I don't I, like I don't see it being AD, although, you know, if he was playing the four, I can see it, but since AD's a center and Jericho Sims is out there, I don't see why you would want to put Jericho Sims on LeBron James. There's not many people who could guard LeBron James. You're not gonna stop Le- LeBron James. So we're not looking for that. It's just you gotta try to slow him down as well as AD down. But I think Matchup wise, I think we'll see Sims on AD, and I think we will see uh, Randall on LeBron James. Just because you look at the other, you'll keep your starting lineup with Schroeder, Beverly, Lonnie Walker. I mean, that's just you got RJ, Brunson, Grimes. They're all that's like perfectly all lined up for those guys to match up with. So I don't see why you'd want to switch any of those up. And I don't see like even though Grimes is our best defender, asking him to guard LeBron James is not a task I would ask him to do. Mm-hmm. So. I think it will be LeBron James and Julius Randle, which will be a good matchup. It will be a good matchup, man. All right, so we already understand the whole Randle and LeBron James matchup right now. But my question for you, Alex, is, you know, for the Knicks, we like to rely heavily on drop coverage. You know, we'll live and die by the opponent shooting threes because Tibbs likes his guys being able to close out, trying to stop them from, you know, he'll give up like the wide open three for the most part and have guys try to close out because he's trying to protect the paint, which bites us in the butt sometimes, depending on who we're facing, especially when you're playing a team like the Celtics, any other good three-point shooting team like we saw it against the Nets yesterday, they hit, who was it? They hit 22 threes yesterday against us. 22 threes. That tells you how how much, even though it wasn't <laughs> like it, it, it's not because only that he he it's closing out on threes, but the guys weren't making crisp rotations either. But thankfully, looking at the Los Angeles Lakers, they're not a good three-point shooting team, just like the Knicks. Mm-hmm. So what's the game plan for the Lakers? Because the Knicks, we like to attack the paint. That's what we do. We live inside 15 and closer. That's how we do. What's it for the Lakers? Hey, man, I, sometimes I, I have no idea night to night what the game plan is going to be. And I think I, I do think that they're going to try and establish um, some paint dominance. I mean, you have Anthony Davis and LeBron James is AD's third game back. Um, you know, he, he had a he did not have an AD like game against Boston. He only had 16 and 10, no steals, no blocks. I think that they're going to probably try and establish him a little bit more. Um, and, you know, we didn't see a whole lot of it, a lot of it against Boston, but in uh, Rui, Rui's first game, they he operated on the block out of the paint a bit more. Mm-hmm. I think the Lakers are going to try and play in the paint. Um, frankly, that's what they need to do, man. I mean, if they come out there and they want to start shooting threes first, you guys are going to jump out to a 10 or 15 point lead. And then it's just going to be all uphill, you know, rest of the night. So establish the inside. That's, that's what I think they're going to try and do. Well, who the hell knows? <laughs> <laughs> this sounds just like a Knicks team, man, in all honesty, because sometimes, <laughs> you know, as much as Randall has improved as his three-point shot and, like, Brunson, Grimes are a good three-point shooter, RJ has become a better three-point shooter, like, we're not that type of three-point shooting team. Like, we're shooting at, like, where we can shoot a high clip and knock them down at a high clip. So we're we're, we're fine. We're not great. So if the Knicks try that attempt, too, it can go sideways as well. So I hope they come out <laughs> wanting to establish, like how you're saying for the Lakers, some paint presence and really go from there because that is their strength, you know. And, and looking at the remaining, the remainders, uh, the remainder of the the both starting lineups, you know, I'm going to expect Pat Bev to be on Jalen Brunson and try to to hold him in check from game for so that Brunson doesn't get going. And I think it's going to come down to you know for. For our side, can Jericho Sims slow down Anthony Davis? Obviously, it's going to be can Randall and LeBron James. It's going to be both of them trying to slow down each other, and can they keep up with each other? But then I'm looking at RJ and Quentin Grimes as a remainder in the starting rotation. Like, are we going to get some solid contribution from them? I'd expect Lonnie Walker on RJ and Dennis Schroeder on Quentin Grimes. Would you, would you agree with that? I got to disagree, Alex, man. 
um, mm. only on this. If it, tomorrow, I mean, when they play, man, you know, hit me up, and, or maybe I'll hit you up. Uh, but watch Pat Bev be on RJ. Really? Pat Bev is going to be on RJ. He shouldn't be. He should not be. But it would not surprise me if they put Pat Bev on RJ and they put Dennis on Brunson to pressure the ball. Mm. That's what I think they're going to try and do. Interesting. And why? Why is? Why is that? I, I just want to know, like, what uh, you've watched more Laker games than I have. So, what is the strategy behind that? Because I would figure that you know our our most clutch player, our 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 instrumental guy who's really helped change this team around, Jalen Brunson, that you'd put your best defender and Pat Bev on him. So, what what's the thought process behind that? It's so um, Dennis is really one of our better point of attack defenders, mm-hmm. and Darwin really likes that type of defensive approach. So he's gonna you know, kind of unleash Dennis and let Dennis just kind of blitz Brunson. That's what I think. Mm. I think as it relates to RJ, for whatever reason, man, all season long, Pat Bev has started out on the opposing team's best wing player all mm. season long, whether that's whether that's Kevin Durant or anybody else, man. Like, think how insane that is. That you say that like out loud is Pat crazy. On Kevin Durant. <laughs> right. And now, and I'm not saying it works because trust me, it doesn't, <laughs> but, <laughs> but they, the Lakers, the Lakers coaching staff, um, they view Pat Bev as their wing, wing stopper, okay. even though he's only like six, one, they're going to put him on RJ. I, I bet money. That's what's going to happen. Oh my and, goodness. This is going to be know. interesting. <laughs> yeah. This is going to be interesting. Yep. All right, I'm re- I'm already looking forward to this just so that we can hit each other up tomorrow. I'll be like, yo, what? I'm gonna be like, I'll be, I'll be, sh- I, I know you know your team better. I'll just, I'm, I'll be lost in that whole in that whole approach. But hey, you guys do what you guys do. You know what I mean? Um, but let's get to the battle of the benches, man, because this is where this is the next thing that for the Knicks, our second unit for a while has been struggling uh, to keep up with opposing teams on the season. The Knicks. Nick's second unit has ranked 26 when it comes to points, points scored. And I'm pretty sure that's still, the, that's still the same today. Let me just do a quick check. Yep, they're still 26 when it comes to points scored, while the Lakers rank – where are you guys? Why, why, why are you guys hiding on me? Why are you guys hiding? Got to be on the bottom. No, you guys are six. You guys are six when it comes to bench scoring. You guys are six in the NBA when it comes to bench scoring. So – that tells you, you know, how I, that tells you a lot because typically what happens for the Knicks, except, and I'm going to exclude these past three games against the Cavs, the, the Celtics, and, and somewhat the Nets because even though they didn't come out there and break the lead, they didn't really lose us the game either. I'm going to say that mm-hmm. um, because in past, we have seen our second unit lose the game for us, and that means – the starters have to come back in with little rest and play these crazy amount of minutes. So give me a little insight onto the Lakers bench. You know, I know it's Westbrook. Who yep. else you got going? I know Rui's now out there. Tell me, tell us a little bit about the bench. So the bench, it's going to be interesting, man, because um, AD, these first two games back, he's come off the bench. Although in the second half against Boston, he actually started. So I'm I'm curious to see if they start AD against the Knicks or they bring him off the bench. So that's that's going to determine a whole lot. Um, but obviously there's Russ. He's averaging 15 a game off the bench, and he got he leads the bench unit, if you will. Um, I think that you know I, Rui is still learning the playbook, quote unquote. And so um, you know some Lakers fans don't think Darvin has a playbook, but I digress. So <laughs> Rui is still learning the playbook um and so i'd like to see him featured a little bit more it's weird with us man because there are good guys on our bench that like even against boston guy did not do not plays like uh for example max christie he's a young guy as a rookie but he's energetic um he's got good size i'd like to see him play um it just depends on i think does ad start or not that's to me that's going to shake things up and then there's thomas bryant off the bench when AD was out, Thomas Bryant was starting and playing really, really, really good minutes. But off the bench, um, he hasn't been as strong these last mm. couple games. So I don't know. I, it's it's hard to say. I would. It wouldn't also surprise me if you know it's Madison Square Garden, you know it's the Lakers Knicks, 
you know, maybe, you know, Westbrook tries to, you know, do a vintage Westbrook game because it's a, you know, MSG and all that kind of stuff that could derail the Lakers a little bit. Um, but from game to game, we don't always know what the rotation is going to look like. And that's why it's hard for me to even know, aside from Russ, um, and not knowing if AD is going to start or come off the bench. Darwin gives some of these guys do not plays, man. And it's just like, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> you talk, you're just, now you're giving me, now you're making me worry because uh, when you talk about Russ having a vintage game, you know, his Madison Square Garden, we allow everybody <laughs> to come through no matter who you are, whether you're Ricky Rubio, you know, we got, we get, we allow everybody to just show up and show out guys who shouldn't be three point specialists become three point specialists. You know, we had CD Oseman one, one uh, last year, looking like Clay Thompson when he came, <laughs> when he came rolling through. So when you, when you, when I say, when I hear that, it, it makes me a little, it gives me some angst, man. It gives me some angst. All right. But look, over the last three, over the last three games, like I said, the Knicks have been playing better. Their bench has been playing better, especially with Hartenstein. Um, quickly has really been instrumental for us off the bench. You know, his defense, his playmaking, you know, his shot creation has really taken another step forward within the th for a third-year guard. It comes down to Obi. Will Obi get some minutes? You know, he got 16 against the Celtics, went back to getting 10. Mm -hmm. I know he's working from an injury, but we need him to be hyper-efficient in those minutes as well. Um, Hartenstein, he's played well this week. He hasn't really fit in, but now we're, we saw some passing, us utilizing his passing chops. His scoring, that's really who he is, not this defensive uh, rim protector that we get from Mitchell Robinson, who's out, or Jericho Sims. And then it's Miles McBride, who defense, great. Offense, a little, little it's, there's not much to be desired, but I also understand he's a second-year guy, first time really getting extensive NBA minutes, and a lot of young guys, just like how you talked about for him being a, a young rookie coach, right? They got to work through some of their issues and figure stuff out. So it's the same thing for him. So it will be an interesting matchup because, like I said, you know, this you're, the Lakers are got a really good bench. Top six. Top six in the league. Knicks, 26. Lakers are six. Over the last three games, as I'm pulling it up right now, the Knicks are ranked 20. Where is it? Knicks are ranked 20. 21st they're tied for 21st so they, they they've improved they're improving hopefully they they're they're better <laughs> moving forward so that way we can have a competitive game but to close this game out man to close this uh not this game but to close out this preview what are your what is your score prediction for this game and i'll let you go first since you are our guest you know it wouldn't surprise me man if it's if it's a a, a high scoring game uh i i would probably say 125 to maybe 115. Wow. Something like that. And you're going Lakers, obviously. <laughs> yeah, I better. <laughs> I'm about to say, man, don't come. you know, I had some, I had some give me the whole rope a dope around here where they are like, you know, the Knicks are gonna win this one. And then then they say that and then the Knicks come out and lose. And I'm like, all right, just say your team's gonna win. Don't <laughs> don't be that gracious to us, okay? And of course, I'm gonna go with the Knicks. I think it's going to be I think it's going to be a lot of inside scoring. I know the league has high scoring affairs. I think it'll be a lot of inside scoring. So I think it'll be I'm going to go 115 110 mix because that's just it, that it's just like I think there's going to be a good amount of defense. But I think it's just going to be a lot of scoring. I think a lot of teams good. I think it's going to be uh who plays defense at the critical time which will be the fourth quarter. Hopefully in the first quarter because the Knicks need to do that. Not, not play no defense like they get it uh, against the <laughs> Brooklyn Nets. But let's hope for the Knicks fans. You know, hopefully uh, I can come out here being happy uh, on post game. All right, hopefully. So with that, Alex, thank you for coming through and previewing this game. Please let our listeners know where they can find you if you got any upcoming work and all of that. Yeah, man, I appreciate you guys having me on. Um... If you care to follow follow me, follow the Lakers, you can follow me on Twitter and, and Instagram at Central365. That, that's where you can find me at right now. All right. Alex, thank you so much for coming through and previewing this game. And to Knicks Nation out there, thank you for tuning in for another Game of the Week preview. 
Make sure to hit that thumbs up button for your boys. Make sure to share all these videos. Make sure to clip them up. Share them with your family members, your friends, whoever, your cats, your dogs, all right? Let them know about Knicks Fan TV and what we're doing over here. Join the movement. We're close. We're closing in on 60K subscribers. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already done so. And we're available on all audio listening platforms, whether it's Apple, Spotify, Google Play, Amazon, Alexa, Stitcher, you name it. We are there. Also, make sure to follow us on all of our social media accounts. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, even TikTok. So you can find us all over there. Follow all the content. Make sure you're up to date with all the Knicks news and rumors. And also make sure to check out KnicksFanTV.com where you can find Remy's recap the day after every single game. All right, Remy does a great job of breaking down each and every player's performance, gives him, gives you his rating. And that way, if you didn't catch the game, you're busy, you're on the road, and you got a quick pit stop, and you got some time to read, make sure to go check it over there. And Knicks Nation will catch you for post game after the Knicks face the LA Lakers at home at Madison Square Garden, 7:30 p.m. on TNT. All right, we out.